This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944 8344. That's 944 8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. VSH.org. Good evening. I am the Director of Wellness and Lifestyle Medicine at Castle Medical Center, and I also represent the Seventh-day Adventist Church here in Hawaii as the Health Director for the Seventh-day Adventist Church of Hawaii. And both Castle Medical Center and the Seventh-day Adventist Church is a vegetarian-friendly medical center and a vegetarian-friendly church. And both of our organizations commend uh, Howard Lyman for the fantastic work that he has done over these many years in spreading the message of healthy vegetarian cuisine throughout the United States. And we are very happy to be co-sponsors in this event. Thank you. Thank you, John. Howard Lyman is a fourth-generation cattle rancher from Montana. After 20 years of operating a feedlot, and a close brush with death, he sold his ranch and started working for farmers in financial trouble. He worked as a lobbyist in Washington and he ran for Congress in 1982. Howard is the former director of the Beyond Beef campaign and the Humane Society of the United States' Eating with Conscience campaign. He's a past president of both the International Vegetarian Union, IVU, and EarthSave International. Currently, he's executive director of Voice for a Viable Future, a campaign designed to educate people about the benefits of organic, sustainable farming and the dangers of the current methods of food production. Howard has been interviewed on radio stations in over 200 countries and has appeared on hundreds of television shows. Traveling more than 100,000 miles a year, He's spoken to thousands of groups, from small audiences to an assembly of over 25,000 people at an Earth Day celebration in California. We're delighted that he's here in Honolulu with us tonight. Please welcome Howard Lyman. For those of you that don't know, that's my wife. (laughs) Aloha. My name is Howard Lyman. I'm a fourth generation farmer, rancher, feedlot operator. I travel around the world and I talk to people about the proper amount of animal products they have in their diet as being zero. Folks look at me and say, wait a minute, fourth generation farmer, rancher, feedlot operator talking about not eating animal products? This guy must be smoking the number one crop out of California. We've just gone through a very traumatic time in agriculture. Since 1990, I've traveled around and I've talked to people about mad cow disease, bovine, spongiform, encephalopathy. And back in 1990, when I first started speaking about it, people looked at me like I was the one that had holes in my brain because they never heard of it. And on the 23rd of December, 2003, the Secretary of Agriculture stood up and announced the cow that ruined Christmas, the first confirmed case of mad cow disease in the United States of America. But this has been a long journey. This started back when I was on my farm in Montana. We ended up with a a disease in our cattle that was called thrombosis in meningitis, TEM. And it took an animal 
that had a virus and that attacked the brain. It raised the body temperature of the brain for a few seconds and the animal became brain dead. It appeared perfectly healthy, but it would stand there not knowing enough to eat or drink and would starve to death. I lost 10% of my herd. Financially, it was devastating. And in 1990, when I heard about what was happening in England, that they had identified a disease in 1986 that they called mad cow disease, bovine spongiform encephalopathy, and so I went to the Library of Congress and I opened up the books and I looked it up and it said slow-growing virus or bacteria. But you know, here they were with these animals that they were incinerating them at over a thousand degrees and the animal's ash was still infectious. There's no virus or bacteria that can stand that kind of temperature. And so there was a man in the University of California in San Francisco by the name of Dr. Stanley Prusner, and he came up with a theory, and the theory was that this infectious agent was an abnormal protein. Now, wait a minute. A protein has no RNA, no DNA. There's no way in the world the scientific community was going to buy the idea that we had a new infectious agent that was never alive. But sure enough, as we went through the process, more and more people came to believe that yeah, we did have something that wasn't a virus, wasn't a bacteria. Maybe it was an abnormal protein. A normal protein is in a spiral. An abnormal protein is laid out like a slipper. And for some reason, for some reason, this abnormal protein that had no RNA, no DNA, was transferring a signal from abnormal protein to normal protein, turning them abnormal. And in a body, it was a long process. In cows, from three to seven years from the time they were infected until they showed the symptoms. In humans, anywhere from five to forty years. But it had one thing in common. It was 100% fatal. If you had it, you died. So in England, the first identified case was 1986. By 1990, it was an epidemic. They ended up killing over four and a half million head of cattle, incinerated them, and then stored the ash in World War II blimp hangers because it was still infectious. Many things about it that they didn't know, but the one thing they kept saying over and over, not to worry because it could not be transferred from animals to humans. 1996, I happened to be in England. I was there to testify in the McLeibel trial where there's some activists were handing out pamphlets in front of McDonald's. McDonald's, one of the largest corporations in the world, decided to show them that you could not get away with something like that. So they filed suit against them for libel. I was accepted by the English court as a expert witness. So I flew to England. I was there to testify in that trial, and believe it or not, the Minister of Health stood in front of Parliament and he said, we no longer can assure the English people that mad cow disease cannot be transferred from cows to humans. The National Cattlemen's Beef Association said it was the exploding powder keg that was heard around the world. I was the only person in England from the United States that was willing to talk about the issue, and I did 70 press events in nine days. I will never forget the hotel that I was staying in. They set up the breakfast room as a press gallery. 
Italian television came and set up the camera and the lights. I did an interview. They took down their camera and along came CBS. They put up their camera. I did an interview with Dan Rather. Then ABC, NBC, then French television. They took me down to BBC Radio, World Service Tonight, and I was talking to the producer and I said to the producer, how many stations is this on? And he said, I don't know, but we're in 200 countries. 200 countries? He said, yeah, a few thousand stations. I went to England. I was a farm boy. I came back. I was a celebrity. And believe it or not, I flew back into New York City. I'm, I'm walking down the runway, and over the loudspeaker I heard Howard Lyman pick up a white paging telephone. Well, being a celebrity, I looked to my entourage. I was alone. It was Oprah Winfrey. Oprah Winfrey called and said, we'd like to do a show called Dangerous Food. Could it happen here? He said, be a few million people see the show. Well, do you think I jumped at the opportunity to do a show for a few million people being a celebrity? I waited a good four or five seconds before I agreed. She sent me a ticket. I flew to Chicago. The first time I met Oprah Winfrey, I walked in and she was there and came up to me and she said, you know, I saw the movie Babe five times. I will never again eat pork. I can remember looking up and saying, Lord, this is going to be a good day. Well, I'm in the green room waiting for the show to happen. Every one of you guys that's out here, if you're ever going to go on television in front of a few million people, it is your wife's responsibility to call you up and tell you exactly what to say. Well, the phone rang. My wife called me and she told me exactly what to say. And there I was in the green room thinking about this, and they called me out and put me on the stage. I'm sitting on the stage to the right of me, a grandmother from England whose granddaughter is dying of the human form of mad cow disease. To the left of me is a guy from the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. Going through my mind is what my wife said to me. She said, remember, don't say anything stupid. Now, I'm sitting there trying to figure out whether there's a comma in that sentence or not. <laughs> but before I can figure that out, Oprah Winfrey comes out, looks at me and points and says, Here's a man who believes. Within ten years, we could have a disease that would make AIDS look like the common cold. And I said, absolutely. Oprah said, that's a strong statement. I said, Oprah, we have a hundred thousand cows a night dead. In the morning, they're dead. We round them up, grind them up, turn them into feed, feed them back to other cows. We go out and scrape up roadkill, deer, elk, possum, raccoons, scrape them up, grind them up, turn them into feed, feed them back to cows. And then we take euthanized pets. The city of Los Angeles alone, 200 tons of dogs and cats a month are ground up, turned into feed, and fed back to our pets or our food animals. Now I'm telling you, Oprah's eyes are as big as saucers. She turns to the guy from the National Cattlemen's Beef Association and she said, Dr. Weber, are we feeding cows to cows? I'll never forget what he had to say. He said, well, you know, uh, don't got it. Uh, there's a limited amount of that going on. Well, as near as I could tell. But 95% of the cattle in factory feedlots are eating the remains of other animals. And the next thing out of Oprah's mouth, doggone it, gets us sued. She said, that just stops me cold. I will never again eat a burger. Now, she didn't say the meat's infected. She didn't say to the millions of viewers, you shouldn't eat it. She just said, that stops me cold. I will never again eat a burger. Now on that show, I was calling for the fact that we would quit feeding cows to cows. It took about two hours to tape that show. And when we got done, 
I walked up to Oprah and I said, Hey, Oprah, give me ten minutes. I'll get you off a chicken. <laughs> and she looked at me and said, Only one animal a day. <laughs> well, I knew that when I went on that show, the 13 states had a thing that was called food disparagement. It's against the law to say something you know to be false about a perishable commodity. Well, I didn't say anything I knew to be false. Everything I said on that show I fully believed was true. And so I wasn't worried about it. And I went about my business. And a few weeks later I got a call. It was a national news magazine that said, Do you realize you're being sued along with Oprah Winfrey and Harpo Production by a group of Texas cattlemen? I said, no. I said, can I put you on hold? I put them on hold. I raced into my library. I inventoried my vegetarian cookbooks. I knew those cattlemen wanted those vegetarian cookbooks bad. I went and said to them, I said, I can't talk to you now. I got to call Oprah. I called and left a message for Oprah. And I said, hey, Oprah, we lose this suit. I'm throwing in my vegetarian cookbooks. You got to put up the money. Well, believe it or not, before we went to Amarillo, Texas, USDA and FDA did exactly what I called for. They banned feeding cows, sheep, and goats back to cows, sheep, and goats. And I thought we'd go to Amarillo, Texas. The judge, a 72-year-old lady, a tough old heifer, I thought, sure, she'd pick up the hammer, slap it down, and say, case dismissed. But little did I realize, Amarillo, Texas... Not the end of the world, but it is clearly visible from there. <laughs> if you're going to give the world an enema, haul the hose to Amarillo. <laughs> Largest employer in Amarillo, Texas, a slaughter facility killing cattle. Bumper stickers all over town said the only mad cow in Texas is named Oprah. I said to my Attorney, I said, we, we need a change of venue. we got, we got to go somewhere else. We go to the judge and we say to the sweet 72-year-old lady, we said, Your Honor, we'd like a change of venue. She picked up the hammer, slapped it down and said, Motion denied. Bring in the jury pool. 140 people. 140 people walked into the courtroom. You never saw so many hats, boots and belt buckles in all your life and leaned over to my lawyer and I said we better write the appeal today I don't think we have a chance in the world of winning here at the end of the day we had 12 jurors absolutely steeped in the cattle culture I'm talking to my lawyer after the first day of drawing the jury and he said to me he said do you realize the plaintiffs and their attorneys are down in the bar right now laughing and giggling that there are not 12 people in the state of Texas that could be put on the jury to find a vegetarian not liable he said they're going to call you on the stand one of the first questions they ask you is is it not true that you're a vegetarian I said, I can handle that. He said, you better, or we won't win. Well, sure enough, I get called to the stand. The plaintiff's attorney is looking at the jury, he's laughing and giggling, and he said, Mr. Lyman, can't hardly say it. Is it not true that you are a, <laughs> a vegetarian? I looked at the jury and I said, I will not apologize for that that has saved my life. And the jury, they were nodding their heads and never again in that trial did we ever talk about me being a vegetarian. But I will say that they asked me every question you can think of. I'll never forget the plaintiff after day after day suddenly comes to me and he says, Mr. Lyman, has anybody ever called you irresponsible? I said, yes. I look over at my lawyer. He's sitting there going, no, no, no. The plaintiff's attorney looks like he has found the key to the Gordian knot. And he says, who? I said, my wife. <laughs> the jury sitting there saying, huh, been there, done that. <laughs> well, we're in that courtroom for six weeks. A jury that was absolutely steeped in the culture found Oprah, Harpo Production, and myself not liable. 
The cattlemen couldn't believe it. They, they could not believe that we won in Amarillo, Texas. They appealed it to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. We're in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals for a year. And finally, we get a unanimous panel decision that says, Oprah, Harpo Production, and myself are not liable. The cattlemen, they could not stand that. The Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, in their opinion, said everything that Lyman said on the show was true, and the truth is not actionable. The cattlemen immediately asked for a rehearing. It was denied. But you've got to give the cattlemen a lot of credit. They turned around and filed exactly the same cause of action in state court. Not being from the state of Texas, I have the opportunity to move it from state court to federal court. They appealed that, believe it or not, six years. Hundreds of thousands of dollars later, finally the judge throws the case out with prejudice, which means they cannot refile it. But you know, we did that show in Chicago on the Oprah show for a few million people. But after the cattlemen filed the suit, hundreds of millions of people knew about it. Goes to show you they are already showing early stages of mad cow disease. But this is not about telling the truth to the American people. This is about showing that if you have enough money, you can go out and intimidate all of the news media so they do not disseminate the information to the American people. Well, I think, I think we are winning. Because 15% of all teenage girls in North America today claim to be vegetarians. 30% of all student meals served in Stanford University last year in student food service was vegan. Two-thirds of the American people today have given up on their health. They're basically out there saying, hey, I don't care. I'm going to eat it. I'm going to have heart disease, cancer, diabetes, obesity, you name it, it's okay. I don't care. And guess what? Number one killer right now, heart disease. One out of every two people dying in America today, dying of heart disease. One out of three coming down with cancer. One out of four dying of cancer. Two out of every three Americans today either overweight or obese. Diabetes is growing at a phenomenal rate. And on top of all of that, we end up with a confirmed case of mad cow disease. Do you realize 13 years we've been testing in the United States of America for mad cow disease? In 13 years, we have slaughtered over 400 million animals. In 13 years, we tested 57,000. France tests more animals in a month. Out of a herd of only 11 million animals, they test 66,000 animals in a month. We tested 57,000 in 13 years. The European Common Market tests more animals in a day than we tested in 13 years. But we have had, in my opinion, a government policy for 13 years of don't look, don't find. It was like sending a blind man out to find a needle in a haystack. And guess what happens? We, in North America today, have over 4 million people being diagnosed as having Alzheimer's. Well, of those 4 million people that are, die, are diagnosed, over 500,000 of them are dying every year. How many of those people that have Alzheimer's really have the human form of mad cow disease variant CJD? 
Pittsburgh Veterans Hospital took a group of demented people that died, removed their brain, put it under the microscope, and they found 5.5% of them were misdiagnosed, did not have Alzheimer's, really had CJD. Yale University did exactly the same kind of a study, and they found 13% were misdiagnosed. Let's say that, that there was only 5% of them that were misdiagnosed. If you have 500,000 dying every year, that means that you have 25,000 that are dying of the human form of mad cow disease when our government is trying to tell the American people that we only have one case of mad cow disease in humans per million inhabitants. That means that we would have no more than 270 cases in the United States. But if those two studies, the Pittsburgh Veterans Study and the Yale Study, are correct, where are the other 24,000 plus coming from? And how about the new studies that are coming out now? that people are looking at it and saying, wait a minute, Alzheimer's, four million Americans having Alzheimer's. 1900, the disease did not even have a name. It was not even written up in the literature. And today we have more than four million people diagnosed with it. If we go back to 1945, the amount of Alzheimer's in the United States was minuscule. And we're at four million today, and they believe within a handful of years it's going to be up in the neighborhood of 10 or 12 million. What are the similarities between Alzheimer's and new variant CJD, the human form of mad cow disease? Both of them have a long incubation period. Both of them are 100% fatal. If you have either Alzheimer's or the human form of mad cow disease, you will die from the disease. When they start looking at it, it appears that both of them are coming from abnormal protein. If you go to countries that are eating meat with a, an industrial agricultural base, you see Alzheimer's cases growing astronomically. But if you go to places where individuals are eating a lot of meat, like the Cree Indians in Canada, no Alzheimer's. If you go to India, where they do not eat cows, the amount of Alzheimer's, minuscule. If you go to Africa where they are eating bush meat, the amount of Alzheimer's, minuscule. But you go to any industrial country where they are grinding up animal remains, feeding them back to animals, you see that the amount of Alzheimer's is growing astronomically. Now, there's nobody in this room tonight that I believe that has eaten more meat than I have. I came from a fourth generation agricultural operation in Montana. I never, I never turned down the opportunity to eat meat because I was one of the early 300 pound football players in North America. I thought I needed that meat to have the energy to go on the field and knock the other guy down. And so I will tell you that I ate my share. And after I quit playing football, I kept eating the same way and I got well over 300 pounds and my blood pressure was sky high. My cholesterol was over 300. I'd sit down and have lunch and my nose would bleed. Now I was from Montana. I'd rather be caught riding a stolen horse than admitting to somebody I was thinking about becoming a vegetarian. Well, I figured that out. I became the world's worst vegetarian. Lettuce and dairy products. I became a closet vegetarian. 
I lost some weight. My blood pressure came down slightly. My cholesterol came down slightly. And I thought, wow, if I can do that, being the world's worst vegetarian, just think what I could do if I became vegan. And I could spell vegan. I lost 130 pounds. My blood pressure went from sky high to normal. My cholesterol from 300 to 135. Not one person in 40 years of the longest ongoing heart study in the world, the Framingham study, ever had a heart attack, had a cholesterol reading below 150. I'm telling you what, I was thrilled to death. I had the answer. I couldn't hardly wait to share it with my friends, my family, my wife and I have been married for over 36 years. Never one time in 36 years have I ever regretted marrying my wife. Now, she can't say that, but I married better than she did. But I will tell you that between us, we had some relatives that sharing that information with them had the potential to extend their lives. I must admit that I thought a long time about whether I was willing to share that information with them or not. But you know, I used to go up to people and I would point at them and say, let me tell you about my diet. You could see their eyes roll up. You could hear their ears slam shut. They didn't want to hear what you had to say. It took me a long time to learn that you can't go and point at somebody and tell them what they ought to eat. You have to go live your life and wait for them to come and tap you on the shoulder and say, are you one of those V people? And when that happens, you have a 35 second window of opportunity. Remember, it's a 35 second window of opportunity, not a three and a half hour dialogue, to tell them about why they ought to change their diet. But you know, for me, it worked. It was great. I ended up with more energy. I required less sleep. My mind became clearer. I can't imagine how wonderful it was when my wife and I went to one of our class reunions, Great Falls, Montana, walked in the door, you never saw so many canes, crutches, and walkers in all your life. I believe I walked out of the hospital in the grace of God. And I believe that my job was to go and talk to people about making better choices getting away from factory farm agriculture, making real changes in the way we, we operate our lives. Do you realize that every time you reach into your pocket, every time you pull out your wallet, every time you spend a dollar, you're voting on the future? What kind of a future do you want? This isn't about what everybody else should do. It's about what you should be doing. The number... The number of people that are making better decisions in their lifestyle is growing astronomically. After the cow that spoiled Christmas, they did an interview and 25% of the people they interviewed said it was going to make a significant difference in the choices they made in the future. Our job is to arm ourselves with the information so that when somebody comes up and taps you on the shoulder and says, are you one of those V people? Your job is to be able to respond to them. We have people in the audience tonight from Vashon Island in the state of Washington. Two young ladies that went out and started an organic farm. A CSA, Consumer Supported Agriculture, and went out and started producing food as nature intended. Every one of us can make a difference. Whatever we do, ask yourself the question, when you look in the eyes of a child, are you doing something for their future? I believe that mad cow disease 
is a plague that's on this nation to get people's attention. I believe that Alzheimer's is here to show us that those choices that we make do make a difference. It is never too late to change. I stand in front of you tonight, fourth generation cattlemen. I talk to people about making better choices. For me to have the opportunity to stand in front of you, to be able to walk, is a God-given gift. Should I have taken that gift and just gone out to see whether I could have more cattle, more trucks, more combines? Or should we talk to people about making a change? I had the opportunity on the Oprah show to talk to millions of people about common sense. Can you imagine sitting into that courtroom for six weeks and being berated by the cattlemen and their attorneys as being a turncoat from agriculture out there? And then to end up with the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals coming out with their opinion that said everything I said on that show was true and the truth is not actionable. It was difficult to be sued. For the six weeks we were in Amarillo, I could not even talk to my wife about what was happening in the courtroom. There was a gag rule in effect. Those cattlemen did everything in the world to try to get me thrown into jail so that I would have to show up in an orange jumpsuit. But what I said was true. Millions of people learned about it. Being the first person to talk about mad cow disease, you can imagine how many people out there thought that I was out of my tree. But guess what happened? Now I'm talking to people about the upcoming plague of Alzheimer's. Do you realize that statistically as we look at it, if we continue going down the road the way we're going by the year 2050, that 80% of all people over 85 years of age are expected to be diagnosed as having Alzheimer's? Is that the way we should be living? It used to be that when a person ended up at maturity, they were known as a sage. They were the ones that, that held the repository of the information of the species. And today, we're putting them in care centers with people wearing diapers. Is that what we should do? You know, if somebody comes to me and they said, all right, wise guy, I'll allow you to take one thing out of my diet. What's the first thing that you want to take out of my diet? The first thing I would say would be dairy. I came from the largest dairy farm in the state of Montana, and there is no doubt in my mind that dairy is the first thing that I would remove from the diet. And the reason I would do that, and I would tell you about a study that was done at Cornell University. It was a study done on animals. And I'll be the first one to tell you that animal studies do not correlate totally with human studies. But it was interesting. They had a hundred rats. They took those hundred rats and they infected them with aflatoxin, one of the most dangerous carcinogens you can have. And they had all 100 rats infected with cancer. They took half of the rats and they wanted to feed them a diet of 20% animal-based protein and they were looking for something that was extremely cheap and something they had a lot of. And Cornell University had a lot of thing called casein. 87% of dairy product protein is a thing called casein. And so they took these 50 rats 
when they would take a rat with cancer and feed them casein, the cancerous tumor would grow. They take them off of casein, it would shrink. They put them back on casein, it would grow again. And so if somebody said to me, what's the first thing you ought to take out of your diet? The first thing I would say to you is take out dairy. Second thing out, chicken. Colonel Sanders is out there saying, oh no, don't do that to me. But you know, as far as I'm concerned, no product out there has more chemicals, hormones, or antibiotics in it than chicken. That we are actually in large chicken operations, grinding up live chickens and feeding them back to other chickens. They go out and scrape up the manure and feed it to the chickens. Not really what you call finger licking good. First thing out, dairy. Second thing out, chicken. Third, fish. Our government right now is saying to any woman that is considering having a child, maybe you ought to stay away from eating fish because of the mercury that's in the fish. They found that when they did a study reported in Theo Coburn's book, Our Stolen Future, they found that women that were pregnant that were eating fish out of the Great Lakes compared to women living in the same area that were not eating fish and they followed the children for years after they were born. The women eating fish, their children had more dyslexia than the children that came from mothers that were not eating fish. When they did a study of women eating the standard American diet, the IQ of their children was 98. When they did a study of women that were on a plant-based diet, they found the IQ of their children was 116. Isn't it about time that we take a look at the fact that what we're eating is making a significant difference? If I can make the change, can you? I would say that there's not a person in this audience tonight that could not go 60 days without eating animal products. 60 days, 2 months, nothing with a mother, face, or a liver. And if you do that, you don't have to tell anybody that you're a wannabe vegan. You don't even have to tell them you're trying. You can become a closet plant eater. Nobody has to know about it. And at the end of 60 days, ask yourself, how do I feel? How much energy do I have? Is my mind clear? Do I require less sleep? What a gift we can give to ourselves. Now, I've kept you captive listening to what I have to say for probably long enough. What I'd like to do now is I would like to open it up for questions. Now, there are microphones. I'm about half tractor deaf, so you got to get a microphone. you got to ask your question so that we will all know what the question is. And then I will try to answer it. We can either ask questions or have a quiz. Which would you prefer? Are there any questions? I never hear anything in the media about men having the Okay, sure. The question is that we find that many of the cows that are infected with mad cow disease are the milk producing variety of Holsteins. Now in England, remember the average age of a milk cow should be about 25 years. Uh, in the U.S., the average age of a milk cow, according to the United States Department of Agriculture, is four years of age. This disease takes anywhere from three to seven years to show the symptoms. Now, it doesn't mean that the animal isn't infected, but they don't show the symptoms. The question is, could it be in the milk? Well, there was a woman in Japan that had the human form of mad cow disease, CJD. She was pregnant. They removed her child with cesarean section, and they found the umbilical cord, the clostrum of her breast milk, the placenta were all infected with prions. We know that an animal can transfer the prion diseases from the mother to the fetus in the womb. 
when the milk, the claustrum of the milk, showed the prions in it, what that says to me is the answer to the question is yes. I just happened to talk to Carl tonight, and he tells me that he spent too much time in England, so he no longer can donate blood in the United States. If you go down to donate blood, the first question they ask you, has you been to England? And if you have, they won't accept your blood. In England, they don't use their own blood for whole blood transfusions. They import it. So, I will tell you that I think blood can transfer the disease. I think that milk can transfer the disease. Meat can transfer the disease. I think you can actually get it from gel caps that come from hoofs, hides, and horns that many people have one-a-day vitamins in. So I think there's a lot of places that you can get it. Question? Yes, the, the cow is a vegetarian. What sort of insanity caused them to start feeding this vegetarian meat products? And why would the government uh, continue to improve the uh, food? The question is that cows are vegetarian. I don't think there's anybody, even the cattle industry, will dispute that. But the fact of it is, in the slaughter industry, about 50% of the animal is not saleable for human consumption. And so that means that all of that weight of the animal, you either have to pay to put it into to dumps, or you go out and grind it up, turn it into feed and cook it, and you can actually feed it back. Now, blood, the blood from the slaughter of the animal, it's about 80% protein. Manure, just going out, scraping up the manure, which we are feeding back to cows, is 20% protein. If we take meat, meal, where we end up grinding up the intestines and cooking it, 25% of it is feces. So, when you look at it, it is nothing other than absolute greed. Say again. I have cats, and they need animal protein. Okay. Okay, it's a good question. Uh, cats are a true carnivore. They need taurine. It is a protein that if cats do not get protein, they will not thrive. The uh, amazing thing about it is you can get plant-based taurine. If you go to my website, madcowboy.com, we list pet food there that is vegan, has no animal products in it, and you will find veterinarians that will tell you that every study that I know of where they took an animal and put it on a reduced caloric diet, they lived 30% longer. I have a cat. He allows my wife and I to live with him. He happens to be in charge of the world. He is on a plant-based diet, and he is thriving on it. I do not feed any animal products to my cat. And if you read, if you read the label on much of the pet food that's out there, you will see where it says things like animal byproducts, meat meal, bone meal, blood meal, uh -uh, bypass protein, or digest. Digest happens to be the name for manure. Bypass protein is the trick name for ground up animals. Meat meal is where they grind up the intestines and cook them. Bone meal is the bones that are ground up. Uh, blood meal is the blood that is dried and put into pet food. Oh, feeding beans to cats? My cat is not much on beans, but he sure likes peas and corn. The last one I had was a wonderful cantaloupe eater. The question is, is there an affordable way to be tested? There are some studies that are being done right now, uh, much like pregnancy tests, where they either test the urine or the blood uh, about whether you have mad cow disease. The difficulty is the tests that they are working on right now have too many false positives. It's not a good idea to have somebody take a test that comes back and tells them that they have a disease that is a 100% fatal. They are working on it. The only tests they have right now are those after you die that you take the brain out and put it under the microscope. But they are working on it. The question is about tuna or salmon. 
Well, if, if we take uh, almost any fish that's out there and we test them, we will find that one of the biggest problems is mercury. And it is because of the way that, that we have contaminated the water that's out there, along with PCB and dioxin. Dioxin is the most deadly chemical on the face of the earth. It comes from burning plastic. And to give you some idea of what a problem it is, if we went to the North Pole and we found a polar bear, we will find that the polar bear's offsprings right now are about one-third smaller than what they were before because of, of contamination with PCBs and dioxin. If we did a blood test on a polar bear, uh, we would find their body was absolutely loaded with, with dioxin. Dioxin comes from burning plastic. There's not a whole lot of plastic being burned at the North Pole, but there's a lot of it that's being burned, going out into the water, uh, going into the food for the fish. When the fish consume it and swim up into the Alaskan waters and the bears eat the fish, they are ending up with PCBs and dioxin in it. I do not believe there is a safe fish that's out there. Some have lower levels of contamination than others, but when they basically say to a woman, if you are considering having a child, maybe you better not eat fish because of mercury contamination, because you store it in your body, and when you start developing the fetus in the womb, you transfer that mercury from your body into the brain of your child. Uh, is, a, is a fish worth that kind of risk? I don't think so. What's your opinion of genetically engineered food? What's my opinion of genetically engineered food? Uh, it is only good to feed your mother-in-law. <laughs> I think when you look at... I, I, I take that back. I apologize. When you look at the first genetically engineered product that came to market, L-tryptophan, L-tryptophan was genetically engineered in Japan uh, a product that had been used in the natural form for years and years and no problem. When they genetically engineered it, over a hundred people worldwide died from it. When they were going to go and check the factory to find out what went wrong, they mysteriously had a big fire, burned the plant, the records, and the whole thing. I will tell you right now, I see nothing out there in genetically engineering uh, that looks to me like it is good for any of our food. The thing that really bothers me is the only way you can tell that your food is not genetically engineered is to buy certified organic. When you go to a store like Down to Earth, when they have a label out there that says certified organic, that's the only way you know that there is no genetically engineered material in them. So when you go shopping, uh, look for something that says certified organic. Support those people that are growing food correctly, even though it costs more. When they took chemically grown vegetables and fruits against organically grown vegetables and fruits, and they were looking at trace elements, and when you see the analysis that was done, it is just unbelievable the difference in how much more comes from that that is grown organically because organic farmers uh, have to go and build up the soil. And when they do that, it is apparent in the food that are there. And when you see those studies and you see the magnitude of the difference bet between the two of them, I'm telling you, if they were giving away the, the chemically grown fruits and vegetables, I would buy the organic because of the difference that is out there. When people farm correctly, when you actually build up the soil, it is absolutely apparent in the food that comes from it. 
What we'll do is we'll take one more question from each microphone, and then I will stay and talk to anybody as long as you would like. But if we don't get out there, we're going to find those people are eating all of our lunch before we get there. Question. When we're talking about eggs, eggs are basically cholesterol time bombs, unborn embryos. Uh, your son does not need an egg. Uh, I think there's much better, you'd be much better off giving him a Fuji apple than an egg. Uh, uh, the question is, that, as I understand it, that what do we recommend for our children going to school in the pyramid program that's out there? Uh, the first thing I would recommend is get involved in the PTA, uh, go to the PTA, talk to the other mothers about the problems that are associated with it. But the key to it, the key to it is uh, teaching our children and it's not about saying you can't eat this and you shouldn't eat that. What you want to say to them is we eat the way we do because that you are healthier, I am healthier, uh, we're getting along much better than the normal population. But to do something in the schools, it almost has to be done from the inside. And uh, I would make sure that the principal and the teacher I knew exactly what my stand was on diet and I would make sure that they realized that there's no way in the world that I would want the mammary secretion of a bovine fed to my child. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Howard. That was fabulous. Thank you again for coming. I guess I don't have to remind you of the refreshments. This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Three monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and helpful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org.